Today, the man who wants to be the next Prime Minister is here in the studio. Labour leader Keir Starmer will take your calls on immigration, the cost of living, the NHS, whatever you want to ask him. With me, Jeremy Vine. So, good morning. Welcome to a special edition of the show. This morning, we're joined by the man the polls are predicting will be the next Prime Minister, Zakir Starmer. In just a moment, you'll be able to grill the Labour leader yourself on the issues that matter to you. Do you want to know how Labour hope to tackle the channel crisis, protect the NHS, or turn Britain's fortunes around? Maybe you need convincing that anything is going to change at all if Labour get in. Our lines are open right now. Do pick up the phone and you could be speaking to Keir Starmer directly soon. Later, a panel of four Former Tory Minister Anne Widdicombe and journalist Yasmin Alibi-Brown will react to what they've heard this morning and debate whether Keir Starmer is the right man to be the next Prime Minister. We'll find out if he's done enough to convince you as well. 10.35 then, as per normal, the papers will explore whether Vladimir, Vladimir Putin could have targeted Greggs yesterday. At 11.15, Storm will be here. At 12.45, Dawn Neeson is sitting in for Alexis. And let me show you how to get in touch with the help of this board with, it seems, Charlie Brown on today. There we go, okay. 0207 862 is the number to call. Very easy to get in touch, 16p a minute from a landline. Mobile phones may be dearer. You can also get in touch on social media. There's Twitter now, X, there's TikTok, Facebook, Threads, Instagram, and we have a YouTube channel as well. So, thank you for joining us in a rather busy time, Keir Starmer. Thank you for having me on. It's been a little while, I think. <laughs> it, it, has, it has, it has. And we look, or so. look forward to getting calls. What do you say to viewers who say, we don't know what this guy stands for because he keeps ditching his policies? Well, we've been really clear about our focus, which is absolutely dealing with the cost of living crisis, making sure that we get the NHS not just back on its feet, but actually fit for the future, uh, making sure that across the country our public services work for everyone. Because but the big policy went, the £28 billion pounds a year green scheme, shelved. Yeah. Um, the Tories have done huge damage to our economy and we've had to adjust our plans accordingly. Um, as you know, Liz Trust took an axe to the economy, did huge damage. Even now, the government is you know, maxing out the credit card, trying to spend any available money that's left. Um, really but salting you, I mean, the earth for whoever is coming back. Sure, but you, you, you promised this, this green scheme was the centrepiece yeah. policy. You promised it during COVID when we didn't even have an economy. So you, you were telling us it was going to bring money in. I don't understand why you dropped it. The commitment, I've said there are five big things that we want to achieve in government. One of them is the green policy, which is to get to clean power by 2030. That will lower everybody's bills for good give us security so Putin can't put his boot on our throats um, and give us the next generation of jobs. That commitment by 2030 remains in place. So everything that's needed for that commitment is fully costed. And that remains. The spending's gone. That, that, gone. Remain, that remains. Well, yeah. the, the spending that's necessary on that remains on the table. Um, but look, the, the commitment to get to clean power by 2030, that is absolutely firm and we intend to do it. It's going to be difficult. But the prize is great. I mean, many people watching this will know that their energy bills have gone through the roof in the last couple of years. Um, this will bring them down, not just for a short period of time, um, but for good. So we've got to get there. All right. So, so I, I, I mentioned ditching policies. Every time you get come under pressure over a policy, you can it. Ceasefire. No, Jeremy. Well, no, come no, on. Let me just that, do that, a little. Let's not, just do that's a not Ceasefire fair. in Gaza. Look, no, then yes, then who knows? The two-child benefit cap. You're scrapping it, then you're keeping it. Your Rochdale candidate got your support, then the heat gets too high and you drop him. You praise Thatcher, then you say, well, actually, I didn't agree with her. Why do you change everything? Well, let's just take your central um, challenge there in relation to Gaza. We had the worst terrorist attack um, since the Second World War in relation to what happened on October the 7th, terrible terrorist attack by Hamas. Um, and Israel has the right to self-defence. And in the very early days, people were saying uh, there should be an immediate ceasefire. And I said that would only benefit Hamas. We're now months down the line. Thousands of people have been killed in Gaza. There's a threatened offensive in Rafa, where there's a humanitarian catastrophe. And now is the time for a ceasefire. Not earlier. Because the circumstances... It would have saved a lot of lives if you'd done it earlier. The circumstances have changed dramatically. 
And Jeremy, to say to Israel immediately, immediately after October the 7th, you cannot go and get your hostages back by using force. It wasn't something which a serious politician was ever going to say. But we're in a different... We're in a, your we're, supporters wanted you we're, to say that. We're in a different position now. Um, thousands of people have been killed. Uh, there's a desperate situation in Rafa. Um, a million and more people who can't go forwards and can't go backwards. And that's why um, very many people are saying now is the time to stop the fighting, to create the conditions to get the hostages out, get much needed aid in, and for a political process that gets us okay. to, a, to, to a, so, a, a peaceful solution, I understand. a two-state solution. But I gave you a list, didn't I? And I, and I, you know, for example, we don't need to go into a lot of detail, but you were saying you were going to scrap the two-child benefit cap and then you said, no, we're not going to. And I wonder whether you've created this impression in people, Keir Starmer, that if you have a policy on a Monday, you're going to drop it on a Friday. No, well, look, let me take the that challenge on. flip-flop thing. Let me take that challenge on. We have to make sure that we can afford everything that we put in our manifesto. So I'm not going to put anything in the manifesto which we can't deliver. If that means now I have to be clear about that, um, then I'd rather be clear with the British public now than make a pledge that I know can't be afforded because of the damage that's been done to the economy. Nobody watching this thinks that Liz Truss didn't do huge damage to the economy because they're feeling it themselves. Many people watching this have had to change their own plans, where they're going on holiday, if they're going on holiday, what sort of Christmas they're going to have, what they're even buying in the supermarket. People are having to change their plans because of the damage the government right. has done but to isn't the economy. It then, isn't it fair I'd, to ra say... I'd rather look the public in the eye now and say, um, some of the things I would have liked to have done, we can't afford to do because of the damage that's been done. Maybe what, all I'm, of them. what I'm not going to do is promise something now, which I know can't be delivered. I understand. Because trust but in politics is of so Of course, low. and the brutal truth of it is that you are not going to have any more money than the next government, and therefore this is just about how you cut, isn't it? And where are you going to cut to find more money to spend? Well, no, it isn't, because if you take um, the NHS, for example, uh, very dear to my heart, my mum, as you know, was a nurse, my wife works in one of the big London hospitals, so this is a... The, 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 the NHS runs through our DNA. Uh, we need to pick it up, and we will put it up, and put the money into reducing the waiting lists. We've got a plan to reduce the waiting lists by two million appointments a year. So where's the money come That's from? the immediate pickup. Uh, well, the, we had allocated the non-DOM money yeah, for well, that. Well, that's gone. Yeah. Well, sure, and one of the problems is the more policies we put on the table, <laughs> the more the government comes along and takes them. Well, they can... You and know, you'll do that when you're, we're, if we're, you we're, get power as well. You'll they nick can, their policies. We keep that commitment. But with the NHS, we also need to reform the NHS because... Um, the model we've been operating for the last 75 years isn't going to work for the next 75 years. OK, just sorry, need... on the non-DOM thing, just to be clear, if you say you're going to keep it, you mean you're going to cancel the tax cut that the Conservatives gave with the money raised from the non-DOM policy? Well, at the moment, they haven't allocated the money on the non-DOM policy, but we will raise the money elsewhere. We're going through the books, as it were, at the moment, in an orderly way so that we can say where that money will come from. But we're not going to back down on the commitment to the NHS because those waiting lists are far too high. And the doctors are going today, you're going to pay them the 35% they want? Well, the government needs to resolve it. It's well, been going well, on That, that a may be year. you in six months. Well, uh, well, I, amongst the irresponsible things this government has done, I hope they don't add to the list not resolving strikes. So how much do you give people them? People can't wait. Well, they need to get in the room and resolve it. 10%? Well, nobody who's negotiating uh, says on air before negotiating what they would agree. But 20? We've got, we've got to get the government and the unions in the room. Nobody wants these strikes. Nobody who's on the waiting list wants these strikes. The doctors don't want the strikes. They've been going on a year. So the government's got a choice. It either gets in the room and negotiates an agreement and we get back to normal working, or we have potentially another year of strikes. OK, now, we'll come to nobody NHS. Nobody wants another year of strikes. We're going to do a bit more NHS later, but just let me ask you a general question, Keir Starmer. Your party's doing phenomenally well. I rarely see poll ratings where the opposition are on 44%. But interestingly, when people are asked... We've got a graph, I think, which, which shows, you know, um, your own personal rating compared to that. When people are asked if you're doing a good job, the majority say no. So, so how can you be less popular than your party? Well, Sunak is more popular than his party. Well, look, my job was to pick up the Labour Party after the 29 election, when that was the worst election uh, for us since 1935. Um, 
and to lead our party from that position to a position where we could win an election. Most people, it was the 4th of April 2020, so just under four years ago, most people shook me by the hand and said, good luck here, but you'll never turn it around in a five-year period. It's too damaged. It'll take you 10 years at best case scenario. I said, I don't accept that. I'm going to lead this party from the front. I'm going to change the party. I'm going to expose the government as not fit to govern, and then we're going to put ourselves in a credible position to win the election. So that's what I've actually done over the last four years. And I want to um, go to the country to say, we, the country is itself now broken, much like the Labour Party was four years ago, I want to have the opportunity to do the same thing, which is pick things up and turn them around, because many people feel it's not fixable now, the country is too broken. I don't believe that, but I'll have the determination to do um, and to take the country on that change and improvement that I've managed to do with the Labour Party. Separate question, are you feeling sorry for the Princess of Wales at the moment? Yes, I think that we should leave her alone. She's had a difficult um, operation and she deserves privacy. Would you advise Kensington Palace to do anything differently? No, I, I mean, I think politicians advising um, the royal family Kensington Palace is, is wrong. But I do feel just it's a guttural thing, really, um, as a human being, um, that we should just butt out um, and leave her alone uh, is my... my, my hum That's not really a political response. It's mm. a human uh, response as a, as a, as a dad and, and as a human being. All right, stay with us. Keir Starmer will dig into more policies after the break. We'll talk about Rwanda, migrants, the channel crisis. We'll talk about the NHS a bit more too. And it's your chance to speak to the Labour leader and ask him anything you want to. So do get in touch. 0207 862 2222. See you in a moment. Who, um, and I've, I hesitate to raise this, recently said he was asked, what advice would you give Keir Starmer? And he said, lose a few pounds. <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm a bit you surprised. <laughs> no, I, to be perfectly honest, I couldn't care less, but um, I was a bit surprised. Uh, so, I'll have to invite Peter down to my five a side game. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not occurred to me that you, you needed to, to, to lose uh, any weight at all. Would you take, if you needed to, would you take the what is called a fat drug or the anti fat drug, the Azempic? No, no. Just spend a bit not more a, time on the five a side yeah. bench. Is it, is it interesting that the Blairites are giving you that kind of advice? I'm getting advice from everyone all of the time. Right. It's a bit like, obviously, I'm a massive football fan, and uh, it's like being the manager down on the touchline, and 60,000 people are giving you their advice on how they do it differently. So there's a version of that going on. And, and in terms of Labour leaders, and let's say you've got to choose, do you take advice from the Brown lot or the Blair lot? Uh, both, but I talk to Tony a lot about the period just before 97, because obviously um, I'm very interested in talking to people who've won elections and taken a party from opposition into government. In the Labour Party, we've only done that three times. We did it in 1945, we did it in with Attlee, we did it in 1964 with Wilson, and we did it in 97 with mm -hmm. Tony Blair. So talking to Tony and Gordon about that has been really helpful. Mm. For me. Not so much about specific policies, but about the, you know, the pace, the preparedness um, of getting um, an opposition ready for government if we are privileged enough to be voted in to serve. All right, we should focus on migrants, which is a big issue for our viewers. And Pat in Essex, you've got a question for Keir Starmer on this. That's right, yes. Go ahead, Pat. Hi, Pat. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Nice to speak to you. Uh, well, basically, it's what you're going to do about the small boats crossing, because it's, uh, they're coming over these people, they're taking up places that people in England can use, homeless people. Now, what is your policy on doing that? Because obviously that could be a vote winner. Yeah, Pat, really grateful to you for raising this. Um, we've got to stop these boats coming over. Um, there's no ifs or buts. It's a massive problem. And Pat, it gives this sense of having lost control of our borders. What I wouldn't do, Pat, is to grandstand or just try to find headlines in relation to gimmicks that won't work. And I think the Rwanda gimmick is a gimmick that won't work. There's only 300 people that are going to go um, if the scheme ever gets off the ground. There's 130,000 people in the system. So it's a, it's a drop in the ocean. And each person on the flight to Rwanda is going to cost the taxpayer £2 million. Pat, what I would do is start with 
the gangs that are running this awful trade, that are putting people in boats and taking their money, um, and take them down. Pat, before I was a politician, I was a prosecutor, the chief prosecutor for England and Wales. And we worked with other police forces and prosecutors across Europe to take down the people who were terrorist gangs, um, who were moving people and guns and drugs across borders. I know it can be done, um, and that's where I would start. Pat, I'd also process the claims that are here. We've got 130,000 people waiting to have their claims processed. They're being housed in hotels, as you know, Pat. That's costing £8 million um, a week. Um, it's a huge <coughs> amount of money. Um, and then the third thing I'd do, Pat, is a returns um, uh, policy, which actually works, which is if your claim is found to be unfounded, you go back. And the number of people going back, the returns, as we call them, has gone down 40%. So we'd turn that around with 1,000 new staff in a new unit All right. to track Let, down on that. Let's but see Pat, it. Pat, that may sound a bit mundane and not as you know, flashy or gimmicky as the Rwanda programme, but it'll actually work, Pat. What do you think, we Pat? can't leave this uh, unresolved. <laughs> Not really, not really answer me question. Is it going to stop it? That's the thing. Is it going to stop it? Because it's putting a big strain on our economy. As we know, it's costing X amount, promoting them in hotels. The NHS is going, well, we know where that's going, unfortunately. So we need something done. I completely agree, He doesn't Pat. think you can stop it. I do think you can stop well, it. Well, Pat doesn't think you can stop it. Pat, Pat, the only way to stop it, in my view, is to smash the gangs that are Putting they're trying in the boats that. In the That's what they're doing. Well, they're not because we we we. I went over to um, Europol, which is the European um, place where they coordinate policing, um, and to talk about an agreement where we share data, share intelligence, do joint operations. Pat, it dry, I, I really get your view on this, Pat. Those boats that are being used to cross are being made more or less to order. They're being stored in warehouses in Europe. They're being brought to the coast in France and people are getting in them. It is not impossible to take down a business model like that. I know it because I've done it before. But Pat, until we do that, um, we don't have a foot in the door to, to deal with this. We've got to stop these boats, stop people getting here in the first place. And that means taking down the gangs that are running this vile trade. Thank you, Pat, for your call. Neil in Staffordshire, what do you think? Hello there. Good morning to both of you. Hi, Neil. What's your question? Right. My question is, is to do with cost of living, but I'm getting increasingly concerned now. Um, you know, as an ordinary person, an ordinary voter, we can vote for politicians of local council and in government, but we can't vote for whoever runs the, um, the, the water industry. I've just opened my bill for next year, uh, next month, and it's gone up 18.18%. No explanation, 18% rise in one year. This is becoming now taxation without any representation. I can do nothing about that bill. All right. If it goes 18% each year, I'm going to be actually... Well, and, and we could throw in the... the, the well, not throw in, but the, the, the sewage in the rivers and the sea is a disgrace. That's a massive job of work for you to sort that out. Uh, it is a massive job of work, Neil, and... Um, you know, it's 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 the it's the extra money on the bills, but it is also the terrible pollution um, in our rivers and our seas. Um, I went with my kids to Bournemouth um, last summer, and we couldn't go in the water because it was too filthy because of the sewage that was in there. I think that revolts all of us. Uh, and Neil, what we've got to do, I think, is we've got to have much tighter regulation of the water sector, much tighter regulation that we've got. The other thing I'd like to see, Neil, is accountability all the way to the top. So the person at the top is personally liable, particularly in relation to the pollution, because at the moment that isn't happening. Um, and there's got to be that sense of personal um, responsibility. But they've, they've priced in the fines, and and you can have you can give them personal responsibility. You can throw some in jail, but Neil's bill will still go up eighteen percent. Yeah, but that personal responsibility makes a real difference. If the person at the top knows, it's my job that's on the line, or will I'm we on the line. actually see water companies we'll in difference. jail if Labour take power? Well, I'd like to see the pollution go is my better alternative rather than putting people in jail. But we need the threat of that. We need the the accountability to the top. I've run a big organisation. I ran the Crown Prosecution Service with 7,000 staff. Um, it makes a massive difference if the person at the top knows I'm the person in the end that carries the can for this. All right, Neil, thank you so much. Christine in Cambridge Show, you want to ask about migrants or something else? Uh, it's, I want to ask the speaker, um, are you supporting Esther Ranson's bid to have youth in, these, uh, youth in Asia? What in a good England? question. Thank you so much for raising that. That's a great question. Uh, Christine, I am. I, what Esther Ranson wants, um, as you know, 
is for Parliament to have a vote um, on assisted dying. At the moment, it's against the law to help anybody to take their own life. And um, a number of people, um, as you know, uh, have been um, considered for prosecution under that law. Um, I was the chief prosecutor, Christine, for five years, and I had to look at every single case of assisted suicide. Um, and I had to draw up some guidelines, Christine, for prosecutors. And the guidelines I drew up said that um, you have to distinguish between cases where the individual assisting is trying to gain an advantage, taking advantage of a vulnerable person. That should always be against the law. But on the other hand, where there's a settled intent of someone to end their own lives, often because they're very, very ill. This is Esther Ranson's big um, plea, really. Um, and somebody else acts compassionately, that that ought to be seen in a different way. But you, that was the you, support, we made. you support making, stopping it being illegal to assist someone dying. You personally support that? Yes, subject to very strong safeguards. Okay, all right. But, but, you but, but what Esther Ransom wants is, is for Parliament to vote on it. But it's not a Labour policy, that. It's something you'll just, you'll let in, the vote in, happen. In the end, it's uh, this will be a, a free vote. Free vote. Because okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a real matter of conscience. And I, I absolutely recognise there are strong views the other way. My personal um, position is that at the moment, it's a complete crime to do assist in any shape, form or way. Um, and the prosecutor decides in the end whether you're going to be prosecuted. Um, that's a lot of responsibility. It would be better, in my view, if Parliament made the distinction okay. and, and, and decide. But I, it will be a free vote because there will be people in all political parties um, who have strong views on this. Great question, Christine. Thank you so much. After the break, Keir Starmer will take more calls um, and answer more questions on Labour government's plans if it gets into power. 0207 862 See you shortly. Labour leader Keir Every Starmer. Every vote counts. There we go. Ev uh, still here answering your questions about what he would do if he became Prime Minister. Later, former Tory minister Anne Widdicombe and journalist Yasmin Alibi brown will react to what they've heard this morning and will debate whether Sakir is the man for the job. Let's see. We want to go on to your calls. You can still call and speak to Keir Starmer direct. 0207 862 Siobhan is there in Bournemouth. Hi, Siobhan. What's your question? Hi. Um, my question is about uh, the NHS. Um, I am Labour. I'm a supporter. Um, but um, we were worried about, we're Streeting talking about using the private sector. I work in the NHS and when they normally um, send off the easiest cases to private and the private, uh, they make a lot of money and poach poach all our staff so we're even the backlogs get even worse with people who really need our help the most and um and ear cleaning is now no longer um something that is done on the nhs and anybody who has a, a hearing test would have to fork out 80 pounds in order to have their i know their about ears this, this is ear syringing there. yeah but what, what is your question yeah, about this siobhan what was your concern uh, my concern is that um that um, Wes, there's, it's, there's been talk that um, Wes and Kia um, have interest in private health care and will carry on privatising the NHS. And um, I just wanted to answer okay. on that. OK, really. so... And also about the ear Well, hang on, let, let's... We'll, we'll come... OK, ear syringing is important, but privatising... Yeah, we're not going to do that, Siobhan. Um, let me be really clear about that. My mum was a nurse, my sister was a nurse, my wife works in the NHS in one of the big London hospitals and her mum was a doctor. So the NHS runs through our um, DNA as a family. It will always be under Labour, um, publicly funded but with um, private and free things going at the point on, yeah? of, uh, of need. Um, Siobhan, what we, what we are saying is that to clear the backlog, and this, as you know, goes on already, um, we will put some out to the private sector to get those operations done. Um, that's what's happening at the moment, Siobhan, as you know. But that is not, Siobhan, let me reassure you, that is not part of some plan to privatise the NHS in any shape or form. Well, that's form. what she's complaining about. She, she doesn't like the fact that NHS operations are happening in the private sector. No, uh, Siobhan, I understand that. But we have to shift the backlog now. There's um, you know, so many people... Um, on waiting lists that we have to shift mm. it using uh, the private sector to shift the backlog. But Siobhan, that is not about privatising the okay. NHS. It will always be uh, free at the point of need. Uh, so far as you know, under a, that it was created by uh, a Labour government. It's one of the um, proudest things our country 
um, has. And we want to ensure that we don't just look back on the last 75 years and celebrate that we actually pick the NHS up right. and make sure it's there but for the next 75 years. I'll ask years. The, the follow up, Siobhan, and this is important. A lot of people need their ears syringed twice a year. It seems that they all now have to pay privately for that, £80 a shot. Can you stop that? Well, I have to look into... Um, you what, said you want it free at the that. point of supply. That's that's part of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm i not across the detail of that, um, Jeremy. I'm, I, I happily look at um, why that is, but um, uh, and I'm not across the detail. All of right. That. All right. I know it's a big issue. Thank you, Siobhan. Sylvia and Durham, what would you like to ask Keir Starmer? Yeah, good morning, Jeremy. Good morning, Sakia. Hi, Sylvia. Um, my question is very quick. Um, all I want to know is... When you go into government, which I think you will, because you've only got my vote, um, what are you going to do about our young children in this country getting rickets and scurvy because of lack of nutritional food and the elderly dying or suffering with hypothermia because they can't afford put heating on so and living. young families losing their homes because they can't afford to pay mortgages. Okay. That is my question. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia, thank you for raising that. And it, it, I shudder that you even have to ask a question like that in 2024, that that is the state of our country after 14 years of this failure. Sylvia, Sylvia taking the young people first, um, we will, if we get the chance to serve, um, and we are privileged enough to govern the country, we will introduce breakfast clubs in every primary school so that every child um, will be able to come into a breakfast club, have the support they need before school and some food and a meal before school because too many children are starting school hungry, Sylvia, which, as you know, um, is a terrible thing in 2024. So we can do that and we can do that straight away. Obviously, and this goes into older people because I've had heartbreaking stories. I was in Dewsbury uh, last year where an 84-year-old pensioner said to me that she doesn't get out of bed in the winter before midday because she can't afford to put the heating on. And then when she does get out of bed, she's in a sort of thermal um, overcoat uh, most of the time in her own house. We have to sort that out with lower energy bills, Sylvia. And that has to be the long-term um, solution, which is why earlier in the programme we were talking about um, clean power by 2030, which is making sure that our energy bills come down okay. for good, because we can't go on like this, Thank Sylvia. you, Sylvia. Mark in Leicester, show your question for Keir Starmer. Uh, good morning, Sir Keir. Good morning, Jeremy. Hi, um, Mark. Um, right. I'm addressing the elephant in the room, um, Brexit. Bearing oh, yeah. in mind that um, we are losing 6% of GDP year on year because of Brexit, why isn't Sir Keir going to include re-entering the EU on his manifesto? Great question. Well, Mark, because we had a referendum back in 2016 and the country voted to leave the EU. That wasn't my position, but that was the position of the country. The, the problem we've got now, Mark, is we've, not, we've got a deal which isn't particularly good and everybody who's trying to trade knows it. And I think we can improve on that. Um, and we can improve on that in defence, in security, in education, free movement. exchange of young people, not free movement. But we also, Mark, can get um, a better deal when it comes to trade and the economy, which is desperately needed um, for the country. Because... You know, we, we have to turn our economy around. We've had a flatlining economy for 14 years. Our public services are on their knees and it will it will fall to us if we're privileged enough to be voted in to um, roll up our sleeves, um, fix that and do more than just fixing, Mark, um, to actually take our country forward. But you want to get closer to the EU without rejoining. Is yes, that right? Yeah, that's right. But you don't you don't want free movement, which would sort out a bit of our labour shortages. Well, look, people voted in 2016 on Brexit. Free movement was one of the key issues. Um, and we can't simply reverse that. And we are not going to do so. But it does not mean that we can't improve on what we've got. We okay. can improve on what we've got. And we're determined to do so. Uh, if we get the opportunity. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for all the calls on this. Thank you as well to Labour leader Keir Starmer as well for joining us. We will, of course, be inviting the leaders of all the main parties onto the programme in the run-up to the next general election, whenever that might be. Later, we'll look at the day's top stories in the papers, but after the break, our panel and Whitaker and Yasmin Alibi-Brown will give their verdict on what Keir Starmer had to say and whether they think he should be the next Prime Minister. We'll still want to find out what you think of what you've heard so far today. 0207 862 and we'll see you in just a moment. Mm.